I know a few people who can better launch our discussion of Israel under siege than the chairman of the board of directors of the American Jewish International Relations Institute, Richard Shifter. Dick Shifter, if he will allow me this informality, is much more than a superb Washington lawyer. He is a true national asset. Having served as U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Human Rights Commission under President Reagan from 1981 to 1986 and again in 1993, he was also Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs from 1985 to 1992. He was also Special Assistant to President Clinton on the National Security Council from 1993 to 1997 and then Special Advisor to the Secretary of State from 97 until 2001. I ask you to note that Dick worked for both Democratic and Republican presidents. Dick's service was to his country, not to his party. I'm honored to present Dick Shifter. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to extend my sincere thanks to all the people who worked so hard in the preceding weeks to make it possible for this event to take place and for so many of you to have joined us in this event. The subject matter that we are addressing is really of grave importance, and that is what I would like to address myself to now. <clears throat> Prime Minister Netanyahu has said that the State of Israel faces three existential threats, an Iranian nuclear attack, a massive Hezbollah-Hamas attack from Lebanon and Syria, and from Gaza, and the effort to delegitimize Israel internationally. At this gathering, it is our intention to focus on the third threat, the threat of delegitimization. A jury was formed because we believe that the delegitimization threat emanates largely from the United Nations and that to counter it effectively, we need to concentrate our attention on the votes cast against Israel in the UN. I've been around long enough to remember reading about the convening in April 1945 of the San Francisco Conference, whose task it was to write the UN Charter. The newspaper in which I read about it was Stars and Stripes, the Army newspaper, for I was in the US Army in the rural area of Germany at the time. German Army Group B was dissolving right in front of us. German soldiers were putting down their arms and just walking home. It was clear that the war in Europe was about to come to an end. But evidence of the death and destruction that Europe had experienced was all around us. I personally was also aware of the fact that my own parents had been killed in the Holocaust. It was against that background that those of us who followed international events had high hopes for the new international organization that was being formed. We thought that it would usher in a period of world peace. It was about 36 years later that I walked into the room in the old League of Nations building in Geneva in which the UN Human Rights Commission met and took my seat behind the sign that read United States of America. It was a good feeling to be there representing the United States, but I had followed closely with Pat Moynihan who had served as U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N. in the 1970s, had said about the U.N. My hopes were therefore not very high. I soon discovered that the U.N. of 1981 deserved the title that Moynihan gave it in the memoir of his U.N. experience, A Dangerous Place. What I also discovered was that the U.N. had developed a culture of its own, not reflective of the outlook of a cross-section of its membership. It was a culture character, 
characterized by an agenda designed to embarrass the United States and delegitimize Israel. When I returned to the United States from my tour of duty in Geneva, I had a conversation with my friend Jane Kirkpatrick, who had been appointed U.S. Permanent Representative to the U.N. in New York. I still remember her first words to me. Dick, I believe another Holocaust is possible. I am in a cesspool of anti-Semitism. They think that because my name is Kirkpatrick, they can talk freely to me. That same phenomenon, anti-Semitism at the UN, was discussed quite vividly in the book The UN Gang, the account of Pedro San Juan, an American official who headed a division in the UN Secretariat in the 1980s and 1990s. Here's how San Juan put it. I quote, I realized that anti-Semitism was an established part of the UN way of life. It was just a political attitude, well, it was not just a political attitude involving Israel. Anti-Semitism was a cultural mindset that defined the UN culture. Let me just uh, take time out to tell you what San Juan uh, mentions in his book. He started out, he had been appointed by the, uh, basically recommended by the United States, to serve in uh, the UN Secretariat, he had his first meeting with the uh, General Secretary of uh, the, uh, the Secretary General of the UN, uh, Paris de Cuellar from Peru. Um, following uh, his meeting, he went to uh, introduce himself to the people he was going to work with, and uh, there was a Soviet official there. His first word was, oh, you're the new Jewish member here. And then uh, he uh, was greeted as a Jew wherever he went. It was a surprise to him and to others. And uh, he said, you know, uh, I'm of Basque origin, uh, not uh, Jewish. And uh, then he remembered that when he talked to Paris de Cuellar, the Secretary General, mind you, uh, de Cuellar uh, had said, San Juan is a unique name. Uh, among Spanish-speaking people. We usually don't name people after a, a, a saint. So San Juan's answer was, you know, my father thought about that too, and what he concluded was that back in the 15th century, one of our ancestors converted and wanted to demonstrate that he really had converted by having himself, giving himself the name of a saint. So it was on that basis that the Cuellar sent the word out. And uh, uh, what uh, San Juan uh, then explains is in the 10 years that he was in the secretariat where by and large Jews were not permitted to be, or not uh, appointed to, there he was, uh, uh, experiencing anti-Semitism over and over again. It's very interesting if you read that book how much he feels anti-Semitism is part of the UN culture. I also want to say that I encountered this, uh, this matter personally and the person who tipped me off on that happened to be a Monsignor representing the uh, uh, mission of the Holy See. Uh, he was tipping me off about the problem of anti-Semitism that I was encountering. More than 30 years have passed since my first direct introduction to the UN, and regrettably nothing has changed. Its culture of anti-US and anti-Israel sentiment with an added dose of anti-Semitism remains in place. If this outlook does not represent the views of the majority of the governments of the UN member states, you may ask, how did this state of affairs come about? Its creation of a UN culture. That gets us to the key issue that we need to examine. When I served at the UN, I discovered that the UN's majority party, which controlled the UN General Assembly and controls it to this day, consists of three groupings. First, there are those states that, as a matter of governmental policy, vote at the UN in opposition to Israel. Second, there are those states that, as a matter of governmental policy, vote in opposition to the United States such as Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, China, North Korea. 
And then there's a third grouping, states whose governments have no policy reason for voting against the US or Israel, but whose ambassadors to the UN just run along with the crowd. It is this third grouping on which Algeria has focused. You will be truly amazed when you see the list of countries that vote against United States positions. When you tally the voting coincidences of the United States, of all the other UN members, you will find states heavily dependent on US tourism, as well as recipients of large amounts of US assistance. By that I mean half a billion a year or more consistently voting against the United States position on issues deemed important, important by the United States. Given this state of affairs, you may wonder how this UN majority party was formed. It happened in the early 1970s. Fidel Castro and Muammar Gaddafi had been competing for the leadership of the non-aligned movement and decided then to join forces and use the movement to take control of the UN. What they did was to form an anti-Western bloc. Castro brought the Soviet Union and its satellites to that new construct. Gaddafi brought the Organization of the Islamic Conference. The two of them then made a special effort to recruit the ambassadors of other non-European states. What they accomplished was to form at the UN an arrangement among the majority of the diplomats at the UN that resembled a college fraternity. Many of those that had joined the fraternity just followed the lead of the clique that had taken on the task of de facto leadership. The issues were not important. What caused many members to vote as they did was peer pressure. But there's another fact that worked as well. It was Moynihan in his memoir who referred to the influence of emoluments, a polite word for bribes. I was personally made aware of that practice when after the United States had won the vote on a particular resolution on which I had personally worked, the Cuban representative rose to accuse us of having bought votes. When I asked West European colleagues whether this really happens at the UN, they expressed surprise at my naivete, telling me that the Cubans and Libyans are doing it all the time. I've been told that others have since then joined the dispensers of emoluments. What is important to understand is that in the case of the states in this third category, the heads of government often have no idea of how their representatives in New York vote. The concerns of these heads of government relate largely to domestic issues. If they do pay attention to issues of foreign policy, they will concern themselves with relations with their immediate neighbors or other states in the, re in the region. UN resolutions do not rank high on their agenda, and in many instances, they do not even have foreign ministry officials in the capital that have been tasked with to analyze UN resolutions and the votes thereon. Quite understandably, that is the task that is therefore left to the country's representative at the UN. I still recall a conversation I once had with an ambassador of the United States from a small country friendly to the United States. I expressed concern about his country's UN votes. He checked with his New York colleague and told me about the response he got. And the response was, I didn't did not know anyone noticed, I did not know anyone cared. Roughly two thirds of the UN of the one hundred ninety three UN members consistently vote against the US position on a majority of roll call votes. That is about 130 votes. There are those who suggest that we simply get out. That would be contrary, I believe, to the best interests of the United States and also contrary to the best interests of the, of Israel. It is particularly inappropriate in light of the fact that we can change voting patterns at the UN if we only try hard enough. In other words, if we do our parliamentary work, we could turn the UN around. By my count, at least 45 of the votes consistently cast against US positions belong in the third category that I've mentioned. The states that have no basic policy reason for voting as they do. What Algeria has been able to do is inform interested members of Congress of the identity of these states and the specifics of their voting records. The members of Congress, in turn, have reached out to the heads of government, the presidents or prime ministers, told them that the United States has noticed the votes they cast and the United States cares. 
and Senator Cardin was certainly been one of them. There's one UN body where the effort has paid off significantly. In the years from 1972 to 2006, the United States found it necessary to cast 41 vetoes in the UN Security Council on anti-Israel resolutions. On the average, one veto every 10 months. Under the UN Charter, a veto is needed to prevent the adoption of a Security Council resolution only if the sponsors get nine affirmative votes for their text. Since November 2006, there has been only one such veto, one veto for the last 64 months. It isn't that the other side did not try to get many more anti-Israel resolutions passed. The most important of these were the resolutions in 2009 to have the Council adopt the Goldstone Report recommendations directly against Israel, and last year's application by the Palestinian Authority for membership in the United Nations. Both efforts failed. Given the Security Council's membership of 15, it is easy to count votes before calling for a show of hands. If you don't have nine votes for your side, you just don't bother to ask for a vote. And since November 2006, it was only once on the issue of settlements that the other side had the votes. I've called your attention to this drastic change in the UN Security Council voting pattern since 2006. That change did not come about accidentally. I've checked my records to get the exact date of the meeting that laid the foundation for that change. On July 26, 2006, the Democratic and Republican whips, Congressman Hoyer and Congressman Blunt, now Senator Blunt, convened a bipartisan meeting of about a dozen members of the House and gave a jeering opportunity of discussing the issue of the treatment of Israel at the UN. I thus had an opportunity to lay out the case that I've presented to you tonight. There was general agreement in the room with the Algeri thesis that it was possible to effect change and that an effort to do so needs to be started. As you can see, it was started and it has been successful in the Security Council. You may ask what difference it makes whether a resolution loses because it does not get the nine votes or whether it loses because having gotten at least nine votes, it has been vetoed. The answer is that much of the damage done by the UN to both the United States and to Israel is in the field of propaganda. Every veto is followed by an outburst of denunciations of the United States and Israel for, quote, thwarting the will of the international community. As I've pointed out, what we really are dealing with is not the will of the international community, but the will of an international group of diplomats assembled at First Avenue and 44th Street in New York City. The moral of the story is that fighting against the anti-Israel bloc at the UN may be a hopeless cause at the UN headquarters in New York, but it's not a hopeless cause if the issue is raised in the capitals of certain member states. Getting that message out and getting it acted on is a task that we all need to pursue. And now let me add one last point. In this setting in which, as I've pointed out, so many of diplomats just run with the crowd, there are few who do not. We can all be happy to see one of them with us tonight. Ambassador Marlene Moses of Nauru. She and three of the colleagues She and three of her colleagues from the Pacific Island states, some of which are represented here, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau, vote consistently with the United States in opposing the anti-Israel resolutions that take up a truly large portion of the agenda of the UN General Assembly. I shall ask a good friend of Ambassador Moses, our Executive Director, Sharon Wilkes, to introduce her to you now. Thank you. Thank you.